Okay, so here is the introduction now to the, what we're going to discuss. Happiness is not a warm gun. Happiness is something that all of us, on a daily basis, we need that. Happiness, every single person here, what do you want? I want to be happy. Where are you going? To do this. And why are you doing that? Because you want to be happy. The common denominator of all human existence is the desire for happiness. Everything we do is directed towards happiness. And scientifically, we see that if a person doesn't have that realm of happiness, they can't fully function. Now, what is happiness? It's the realm of positive emotion. But as we go on in this series, we'll define it in more clarity. That we all want this realm of positive emotion. And it's not a luxury, it's a necessity. If we don't have that realm of being positive, then we're not going to be able to function. So, here is the dilemma. Sean Akar, who is a uh, very uh, cutting edge from Harvard University, says a great thing. Brilliant people sometimes do the most unintelligent thing possible. In other words, you could be really smart and have a very bad plan, and then life is over. So all of us, regardless of our intelligence, might be really smart with one objective of being happy, but it might be a bad plan, and we still have time to rewind that plan. So before we talk about what works for being happy, let's discuss a little quickly about what doesn't work. So one of the most salient features of our personal generation is that happiness is being liked. If you like me, then I am happy. Social uh, networking enables me to live with the illusion that 579 people really like and are interested in what I'm doing. And because I am liked, I am happy. But in truth, scientifically, the realm of what occurs outside of you doesn't really register towards happiness. But we all are sometimes on the ridiculous pursuit of this need to be liked, and that causes us to disconnect from the main reality of what actually will make us happy. So the exaggerated need to be liked disables self-awareness and enables self-defeat. Meaning, if I am so focused on you liking me, then eventually I will lose sight of who I am. I'll lose that self-awareness. Because I'm not thinking about who I am and what I need, I'm thinking about how you perceive me. Or as I like to say, I am what I think you think I am. I am, my self-definition will no longer be based on reality, it will be based on what I think you think I am. And I think is a very good example is Michael Scott from The Office. That the concept, the metaphor, the very deep metaphor of Michael Scott is that Michael Scott is a boor, boss. He's the regional manager of a paper company. And the goal of a boss when you work for corporate is you want to bring the best out in your employees and you want to enable these people to work together in order to make a profit. But Michael Scott in an exaggerated way really represents all of us in that we don't focus on the job at hand, we're more concerned about being liked. And since he's more concerned about being liked, he focuses only on that realm, which he defines that who is liked? Someone who is funny. So someone who is a comedian is really liked. I will therefore be funny to the point of being a comedian. He's not aware of the fact that he's not funny, and really his humor ultimately is self-defeating. Let's see Michael Scott for a quick second, and we'll see how his humor ultimately destroys him. I've, uh, I've been at Dunder Mifflin for 12 years, the last four as regional manager. You know, These the whole open. reason that we're doing this mm -hmm. is to save money. So you just need to pick a provider and then choose the cheapest plan. Well, that is a kind of a tough assignment. Um, it's not going to be a popular decision job? around the old orifice. So I, well, it's a suicide mission, you know? <laughs> they go, God, we've never worked in a place like this before. You're hilarious. And you get the best out of us. How come Chris Rock can do a routine and everybody finds it hilarious and groundbreaking and then I go and do the exact same routine, same comedic timing, and people file a complaint to corporate. Is it because I'm white and Chris is black? Every time black people want to have a good time, some ignorant ass no, up. No, I take care of my kids. Wait, wait, wait. Is always want that. credit that's for that's something that's they're that's supposed that's to that's do. That's 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 
what you want, cookie? That's awesome. So the concept is, is that <laughs> Michael Scott thinks that he's a comedian, and therefore he's going to make jokes. And he does a bit, same comedic timing as Chris Rock. W what's the problem? It is because you're white and he's black. You can make fun of black people. That's wrong. But he's so super focused on being liked, and in this case being a comedian, that he misses the point. So all of us, we have this concept of a FOMO of being liked. I need you to like me. Please like me. We are all somewhat disappointed that our posts only get a couple of thumbs up. Why? Why? I have so many friends. You're not happy that I'm going out with these people? It's a great picture of me and my friends. We look great. Come on. Give me 30 thumbs up, not seven. We like to be liked. But guess what? We're smart people, and it's a bad plan. Now, there's another bad plan that we all believe in, or so we think. And that is that, oh, I know how I'll be happy. I'll get a lot of money. If I have money, then I'll be happy. Well, science basically says the following. Money makes a difference in happiness if you have nowhere to live, and you have no clothing, and you have no home to live in. That the difference between making $5,000 and $50,000 is significant. The difference between $50,000 and $50 million is not that significant. So we come from a culture in which money, ah, oh, if I have money, I'll be happy. But in truth, it really doesn't work out as a plan. And when we talk about money, what does money do for our generation? It enables us to acquire things. We love acquisition. Now, that's really relevant in our culture because it could very well have been that necessity in the olden days was the mother of invention. But in our generation, invention is the mother of necessity. Because we live in our society where we invent things, we now need them. Everyone knows the famous Louis C.K. bit in which uh, he's on a plane with a guy, they have Wi-Fi on the plane, and all of a sudden he's watching, and the captain comes on and says, I'm really sorry, uh, the Wi-Fi went out. The guy's like, oh man, I can't believe it. Louis C.K.'s like, what are you, they just invented that three seconds ago. Like, what are you, <laughs> you're flying in the air 50,000 feet in a chair. Appreciate the miracle of modern uh, aerospace technology. Like, you're upset there's no Wi-Fi on the plane? But, oh, I need that. When I see people like with a black bear, I'm like, oh, Sorry to hear that. I'm sure it's just for work. But like, well, I need it. I need it right away. I have to have it now. We live in a society in which invention, we, got the, we have these uh, cool things. That's the mother of necessity. What does that ultimately cause? That causes us to be in this following realm, which is pop culture. We're consumers. We, have, we, we remember. We have memories of the old days. And we're in a state of perpetual inadequacy. Because for me to sell you a product, I basically have to intimate, and we love pop culture, we love commercials, we even reminisce and be nostalgic. Yeah, you remember that commercial? Oh yeah, I remember that commercial. You remember being sold an object? Yeah, I remember being suckered into a reality where I needed an object in order to be happy. Our culture is based on the nostalgia of being sold. And that leaves us psychologically in a state of perpetual inadequacy. I am almost happy, but I'm not yet there. When we look at the studies of anorexia and bulimia, we don't see it 40 years ago. We see it now because we're in a state of perpetual inadequacy. When we see depression rates rise nearly tenfold from 1960 to 2010 because we're in a culture of consumerism that causes perpetual inadequacy. The average age of the onset of depression in 1960 was 29 and a half. The average age of the onset of depression in our generation 14 and a half, because we are living in a culture of perpetual inadequacy. So ultimately, we have this thing where like, yeah, mo money, greed is good, etc. But the truth of the matter is, is that it actually doesn't occur that way. Now, studies have been shown that if you look here, this is the rise of the ultimate wealth of America from 1950 to 2010. Now, when you look at this chart, we have become richer, probably two times richer, three times richer than we ever were. Look at the rate of happiness, it's pretty stagnant. So we have more money, but we're not any happier. So ultimately, being liked doesn't lead to happiness, nor does having more money. Well, what about being successful at the job that you have? If I'm successful, if I do good, if you make your mother happy, have a great job, go to great school, well, then, you, then you'll be happy. Well, Sean Acar, who's a professor at Harvard and has a really great book called The Happiness Advantage, talks about the science of whether or not success actually creates happiness. Let's check it out. And what I found is that most companies and schools follow a formula for success, which is this. If I work harder, I'll be more successful. And if I'm more successful, then I'll be happier. 
That undergirds most of our parenting styles, our managing styles, the way that we motivate our behavior. And the problem is it's scientifically broken and backwards for two reasons. First, every time your brain has a success, you just change the goalpost of what success looked like. You got good grades, now you have to get better grades. You got into a good school, now you have to get a better school. You got a good job, now you have to get a better job. You hit your sales target, we're going to change your sales target. And if happiness is on the opposite side of success, your brain never gets there. What we've done is we've pushed happiness over the cognitive horizon as a society. And that's because we think we have to be success successful, then we'll be happier. But the real problem is our brains work in the opposite order. If you can raise somebody's level of positivity in the present, then their brain experiences what we now call a happiness advantage, which is your brain at positive performs significantly better than it does at negative neutral stress. Your intelligence rises, your creativity rises, your energy levels rise. In fact, what we found is that every single business outcome improves. Your brain at positive is 31% more productive than it, your brain at negative neutral or stressed. You're 37% better at sales. Doctors are 19% faster, more accurate at coming up with the correct diagnosis when positive instead of negative neutral or stressed, which means we can reverse the formula. If we can find a way of becoming positive in the present, then our brains work even more successfully as we're able to work harder, faster, and more intelligently. For all of us, we've raised business myth, especially if you were brought up in middle-class Jewish society, that when you are successful, then you will be happy. So don't be happy now. You didn't do well on the test. Do well on the test, then you'll be happy. Finish your meal, you'll get dessert. We say happiness is reserved for those who are successful. But the actual science is the opposite. If you are happy in the now, that will lead to success. If you are unhappy in the now, and you delay happiness for the future success, you will not be happy. And he mentions here in this video, which I'll share with you, that in real truth, that which occurs, that which happens outside of you, is an only 10% indicator of your actual happiness. Basically, the scientific breakdown of happiness goes that about 50% of your general range of happiness is based on your, your set range, your genetic or nature or nurture. It means you're born with a certain realm. Only about 10% of this realm is based on the occurrences that happen to you. What's that 40%? The rest is intentional activity. Actions that you choose to do actually comprise about 40% of what we call happiness. So for a person to actually become happy, step one, you can't say, yeah, how can I be happy? It's raining. How can I be happy? I live on the breeze side and they're banging all the way with the subway. Oh, how can I be happy? I can't have no control. If you, yeah, if I live in the Bahamas, I'd be happy. The truth of the matter is you have a huge control it's within your, uh, your own capabilities to create that realm. So the famous uh, father of positive psychology, Martin Sel Seligman, he basically broke down that there are three realms of the pursuit of happiness that we all ultimately fall into. Step one is called the pleasant life. And that is what we think is good, that we get a lot of stuff, we're happy, people like us, then we will be good. So the realm of the pleasant life is when you ultimately pursue I want to have lots of good things. I want to have ice cream all the time, but I don't want to gain weight. The second level is the good life. That means it's beyond the realm of just pure stimulation. I'm in a what's called flow. I'm, let's say, a carpenter. I really like being a carpenter. Might not be hedonistically pleasurable all the time, but I'm in a flow. But the highest form, based on multiple studies, the ultimate form is called the meaningful life. And the meaningful life means that your particular life is connected to something that is larger than yourself. That's the ultimate realm. That's the scientific objective max happiness. So now, to crunch it together, it goes like this. Scientifically, nothing to do with religion, nothing to do with philosophy. Everybody hopefully admits here in this room that we're alive. And the one thing we could all agree on is to remain alive, to keep whatever we have going. So, to keep what you have going, you have to be happy. You won't be successful in your pursuit of life, however you define that, unless you're happy. And what is the maximum form of happiness when your particular life connects to something larger than yourself, otherwise known as the meaningful life? Well, if that's true, then we have the following math, which goes like this, that if life equals happiness and happiness equals meaning, so then life equals meaning, that it's within the actual system of reality that I need, if I'm going to live, I need to have meaning. Now, we're going to ask a question which we'll come back and answer, which is the following conundrum, SAT word for problem, which is, how can you have a meaningful life if life has no meaning? 
In other words, if you, in a philosophical realm, say, oh yeah, we just ultimately evolved out of some mixture of a chemical soup. Life has no meaning. Oh, life has no meaning. Then how could you have a meaningful life? How do you find meaning in a life that has no meaning? So what we see as an indication, not a proof, but within science we see that human beings are directed, that need ultimately to have a happy life and a meaningful life, a person has to have a form of meaning. How we get that, we're going to deal with that in a second. Act two. Uh, part of you is a Jew. Everybody here, you are a Jew. Part of you is a Jew. So if you want to be on the realm of self-discovery, to be aware of yourself, you have to realize you are a Jew. What does that mean, as we ask? Is that a religious thing? Is that a guilt and anxiety thing? A retail thing? What does that mean to be a Jew? What is that concept? So here is the ultimate definition of what it means to be a Jew. That you are, have the realization that you're part of a nation that is an objective miracle. The realm is, is that in a historic standpoint, when you have 0.2% of the population that survives every desire of annihilation to completely wipe us out, and not only do we survive, but we thrive on a constant basis. As we speak now, reading a newspaper, no, people actually don't read newspapers, sorry, um, but looking at a news site, uh, a person, you look at that, you're like, what? You're telling me the entire Democratic National Convention, well, what's the capital of Jerusalem? That's, that's the whole thing? All world politics is dependent on the Middle East and on terrorism, which ultimately comes down to Iran, which ultimately comes down to Israel, which comes down to the conflict of the Israelis and the Palestinians, which comes down to the division of one city called Jerusalem. Are you serious? Really? That's what we're most concerned about? A majority of UN uh, things that are passed are all about Israel? There's something up with the Jews in a miraculous way. And as we, everyone knows, the famous Mark Quain uh, quote, which is that all things are mortal for the Jew. All the forces pass, but he remains. What's the secret of his immortality? It's not like, oh, we have big noses and we breathe more oxygen, so we're like a little bit stronger there. We've got more power in our brain. Like, I don't think that's the concept. Like, many of you work in finance. I do not think that we control uh, the entire financial realm or the media. What is the secret of our uh, immortality? So here's the answer. Is the answer is in the beginning that when you look back at the point of origination of the Jewish people, that ultimately is the answer. And it goes like this. Here's another concept. We mentioned not only survival, Jews have invented more ideas, have made the word world more intelligible for a longer span and for more people than any other group. I don't think that's, uh, hey, come on, we're Jews, all right, like, yeah, as if this would be an Estonia club, we're like, yeah, we're from Estonia, we're the best. No, I think it's an it's a inarguable reality that there's this huge contribution. Okay, so where does it ultimately come from? So when you look back to the past, the point of origination, you see the following. That we are all descendants of Abraham. As you know, that Abraham is called Abraham, Abraham Ha'ivri, the, the person who comes from the other side. What does it mean he comes from the other side? On a simple basis, it means he came from the, over the Jordan River. But on a real basis, it means that at that time period, yeah, people believe that there are, what you see is what you get. There are various forces, sun, moon, rain. Oh, there are various gods. He came from the other side to say no. If you're walking in a forest and you see a castle with a light burning, obviously somebody built that castle. Obviously somebody lit that light. If you see a world that has tremendous order, it obviously is indicative that there's a purpose to the world, that the world was created on purpose and that everything connects together. That was a huge radical statement. To say that the world has a purpose, that the order indicates purpose, absolutely changed the face of modern civilization. Because what's the causality that the order indicates purpose and that we're all connected as one? That means your problems are my problems, that I'm responsible for you, that if you need food, I have to let you in, that I have to care about you, that we are all in it together, that we are all one. That changed the face of the world forever. And as Paul Johnson, a non-Jewish uh, historian who says in his uh, book called The History of the Jews, famous concept, he says like this, that what would have happened to the human race if Abraham had stayed in Ur, kept his higher notions to himself, no specific Jewish people had come into being? What would have happened? 
That's way too many words on a piece of paper. Uh, a, lot of, <laughs> a lot of things would not have happened. That we would not have had all the basic furniture, the moral furniture that we have today. And as he concludes, this is an epilogue for his uh, book called The History of the Jews, that this result, the result was monotheism and the three great religions which profess it. And I'll leave you the rest to do that. Meaning, this realm of we are descendants, if somebody converts, they're called son of Abraham, daughter of Abraham. This realm, this radical paradigm shift, changed the universe. That even though what you see is a physical realm that looks divergent and not connected, he came to say it's all connected. Now, you might say, listen, that's really nice. It's very good. I'll tell my grandmother. But come on. We're modern, intelligent people here. We believe in God. God created the world. Come on. Well, what are you, in the Stone Age? We've been living for the past 100 years. What do you mean? Big Bang, age of the universe, carbon-14 da uh, 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 dating, reality of evolution. Come on. Are you serious? So, and I'll post more of these articles for you to read. No. If anything, the opposite is true. There is no proof, nor will there ever be an absolute empirical proof of the existence of God. But if you study modern science and you see the development, starting with the discovery of the Big Bang, that changed the course and the notions of scientists. And the ultimate example is Einstein. When Einstein created his initial theory of general relativity, he admittedly fudged one of the mathematical equations, and his assistant noticed it. Now, that intentional error in his mathematical equations, which in 1930 became apparent and he changed it, was because he concluded that if that mathematical equation would be true, then the universe had a moment of inception, that the world came into being at a particular point. Till that po point, especially according to the Greeks, we believe the world always existed. There was never a moment of inception. But his mathematical uh, uh, equations plus the Hubble telescope enabled us to see that there was a big bang, that at one particular point, time was created, the world was created. For the first time ever, it was relevant in the beginning because now we saw from a scientific level that there was a beginning. And all scientists believe that if there was a beginning, the statistical probability of its occurrence through randomness is highly improbable. And we see further the reality of Abraham is indicated in this famous experiment, which I will share with you now. It's called the einstein podolsky rosen experiment. Check it out. It's very cool. The einstein podolsky rosen experiment that was done to demonstrate a hypothesis that bothered Einstein no end, uh, what he characterized as spooky action at a distance. And it basically had to do with two electrons that had been in connection with each other and then went off at infinite distances. And if the spin of one electron changed, the spin of the distant electron would change at the same moment. Now, there's no known mechanism for that, because if something has to travel distances, uh, there should also be a factor of time. It should not happen simultaneously. Uh, it's known otherwise as quantum entanglement. So this realm of quantum entanglement and quantum mechanics means that if, if I move one electron, I move the other one, well, nothing travels faster than the speed of light. So how could it be that I move one electron, the other electron moves immediately? How could that be? Must be that there's a thing called a non-locale, that they are not, there's not a specificity, but there is a thread that runs within the universe that shows that the entire universe is connected as one. And that's exactly what Abraham came to say. Even though it wasn't apparent, he came to say the Hebrew word echad, that it is all one, that everything is connected. And as we see further, that modern science more and more shows that indication. The whole concept of the Higgs particle, that there's one particle that goes through everything, even blank space, that gives all atoms matter, indicates that there is a method to this realm of Big Bang. There's a method to this realm of inception. And now just to fuse the two together, it goes like this, that modern science in the field of psychology says the following, you cannot live unless you are happy. And you cannot be maximally happy unless you have meaning. So there's an indication from the science of, psych of psychology that we are hardwired for meaning. And there's indication in the modern science of physics that 
in the universe, it's more indicative that there's, it's created on purpose and with a purpose than not. And when you put the two together, I think you have the actual chemical reality of what the makeup of a Jew is. The reality of a Jew is based on the inception, which is Abraham, and that is that the world has a purpose, and therefore my life has a purpose. My purpose in life has to be connected to the general purpose of the world. What Abraham's point of inception and what we benefit from today and what makes the Jews radical and part of our miraculous uh, survival throughout these years is that we are holding on to a singular message that the world has a purpose and that we in our individual lives are connected to that. That's very nice philosophically, historically, and scientifically, and psychologically, but the most relevant point that I just want to share with you is that that's really the gateway to happiness. That when you have that information, it's your personal building block of how to get happy. So, period, thank you guys for listening. And what we're going to do now is in a uh, orderly fashion, we're going to break up into discussion groups, just talk about this a little bit, and we're going to come back, I'm going to just wrap it up with a little bit of an idea, and that's all. Thank you. All right, guys, so